congratulations on getting here on a Saturday. For those of us who are parents, that is no small feat. Um, in Pasadena, where I live, about 30 miles from here, we have AYSO soccer. Do you have, did y'all have AYSO soccer? I think it stands for something like Athletic Youth or American Youth Soccer Organization. I thought of it when I had three kids who were playing soccer as all your Saturdays occupied, is what AYSO soccer was for me. So whether you have kids who are playing soccer, kids who are in the band, kids who are just juggling APs, for those of you who are grandparents, we are so glad that you're here too and that you've made time on a Saturday. Um, Ken did a wonderful job in my introduction. This is a picture of our family from, oh, four or five years ago. Our friend Adria came over to our house to take pictures for our Christmas card. There's our oldest son, Nathan, and our middle, Krista, and our youngest, Jessica. Now, unbeknownst to us, while Adria was taking pictures, she never stopped. And so when we were kind of doing other things as a family, she kept taking pictures. So the next picture I'm going to show you, we were not posing for, okay? But this is also what Adria captured when it came to our families. And I actually wish, in hindsight, for our Christmas card, we had put both pictures on. Because that's actually a more accurate reflection of what it's like to parent, step-parent, be a caregiver, guardian, grandparent today. Now, I want you to look at my husband in the upper right-hand corner in this picture, and then there he is in the upper right-hand corner in that picture. And so, yes, part of the secret of the Powell family is in the midst of the ups and downs, my husband Dave is an engineer and is so very steady. So, somebody else I see is married to an engineer. It's good, good qualities in a spouse. We're going to be honest today, and by the way, you have notes in your blue folder if you want to follow along and jot down some ideas and fill in some blanks. We're going to try to be as honest as possible with what's happening with young people broadly and maybe young people in your home. The best research indicates, if you, if you curate, if you look at all the best studies on young people's faith, which I love that that's what we're starting with today, on young people's face, the best data indicates that about 40 to 50% or close to one in two young people from great families like yours, from great churches like this one, about one in two young people drift from God and the church after they graduate from high school. Now, as a mom and a leader and a follower of Jesus, I'm not satisfied with that, are you? Okay, that was pretty wimpy. If that's our level of dissatisfaction, then I think we should you know, adjourn and do something else together. So let's try that again. When I think about one in two, 40 to 50% of young people who graduate from great youth ministries like this one, drifting from God and the church, I'm not satisfied with that. Are you? No. So much better. Way to go, CBCC. Now, you might say, well, those are the students, the ones who drift. Those are the ones who, you know, they were never that serious about their faith. Not so. About four of five who those, of those who drift from faith after high school intended to stay connected to Jesus and the church. So they had all intents and purposes of staying connected to the church, and yet they end up drifting. So I get to work with about a 30-person team at Fuller Seminary, the mission of FYI is to equip diverse leaders and families so that faithful young people can change our world. As we see young people being changed by Jesus, they are going to change our world. And so what we did to try to respond to this widespread national drift is we studied over 500 youth group graduates during their first three years in college. Now, I used to say 500 youth group graduates through their junior year of college, but for college students today, first three years and junior year, not always the same thing, okay, for today's college students. So we studied over 500 diverse college students during their first three years of high school. And then we paired that with deep dives uh, with 50 families doing amazing, amazing work when it comes to building sticky faith in their kids. What encourages me in the midst of this research is that it is never too early 
Whether you're pregnant or with a preschooler, or it is never too late, whether you're grandparenting college students, it is never too late to put into practice the principles and the ideas that we're gonna talk about today. As I was praying for today, I was asking, Lord, you know, what's the word that you have for this group? And the word that I felt led to pray for you all is encourage, which I think sometimes we can think of as putting courage into us. I love my kids. I am crazy about my kids. But let me just say, parenting is the hardest thing that I do. My job at Fuller is fairly complicated. It is a piece of chocolate cake compared to parenting my kids. And in the midst of today, I want us to guard against the temptations of comparison and condemnation. Because even as I share research and stories of what amazing families are doing, the last thing I want you to do is to walk away and feel inadequate, to feel not enough. I was listening to a podcast on my drive out here, and it was with the child of a well-known leader, the adult child of a well-known leader. And before I pushed play on the podcast, I thought, wait a second, am I going to listen to this podcast and hear this, this adult child talk about how well they were parented and feel insecure about my own parenting? That was me an hour ago on the drive here. So we want to, and I know this is Ken's heart, we want to put courage into you and equip you for this journey of parenting, especially we're starting this morning when it comes to faith. You know, one thing before we get into the research, I, I, I felt like I was supposed to say this to you. You are the parent, the step-parent, the grandparent your kids need. You are the parent, the guardian, the caregiver, the mentor that your kids need. So let's free ourselves from comparison and insecurity. Let's learn together, absolutely. Let's encourage each other. Let's stay hopeful because of God's grace which sustains us. So with that framing, we're gonna look at four different shifts that we can put into practice with the young people closest to us to help build longer term faith or what we call sticky faith. And as much as I'm a researcher, I'm a pragmatist. And my own kids are now 21, 19, and 16. And let me just say, the research that we talked about, it influenced how I talked to my 19 year old yesterday. The research that we're talking about, it's shaping how I'm gonna talk to my 16 year old about an application she's filling out this afternoon where she wants my help. This research can make a difference every day. So you ready to dive in? Yeah. Okay, awesome. First, how, how in our talking can we build longer term faith in young people? Well, I love when research, research often confirms what we might already know, but I love it when research brings a new twist to our understanding. And so in the midst of studying 500 youth group graduates, in the midst of going deep with 50 families, here's one of the th interesting things we learned when it comes to talking with our kids about faith. As important as it is for us as parents to share our own experiences, excuse me, as important as it is for us to ask questions, it's just as important for us to ask, to share our own experience. Let me try that again. As important as it is for us to ask questions, it's just as important for us to share our own experiences. See, a lot of times what we do when it comes to dialogues about faith is we ask our kids questions. And before our research, this is what I used to do. You know, whether in the minivan ride on the way home from church or, or at lunch or whatever it might be. Well, hey, hey guys, what did you talk about at church? How was it? What'd you learn? What'd you have fun doing, et cetera? And I was interviewing my kids but I was never sharing what I was learning as a youth ministry volunteer. My husband was never sharing what he was learning from our worship services. I was interviewing my kids instead of sharing my own journey. So the good news, I have good news for you folks. We don't have to necessarily be more spiritual than we are. We don't have to act more spiritual than we are. 
we can just share with our kids the spirituality that we already have. So it's not just about asking our kids questions, which we'll often do with our kids' faith. It's also about sharing our own experiences. Here's one of the biggest surprises in our research is the role of doubt in young person's faith journey. We tend to think that doubt is somehow toxic to faith. But that's not what we found in our research. When young people had doubt, and by the way, about 70% of the young people we surveyed from youth, who were youth graduates, 70% of them had significant doubts about the faith. When they had those doubts, if they had the opportunity to express and explore those doubts, that was actually correlated with mature faith, or what we call sticky faith. This is good news in the midst of a world where faith is more and more being deconstructed. It's not doubt that is toxic to faith, it's silence. So when we have the opportunity to express and explore questions with our kids, that can actually lead to longer term faith. So just a couple research twists to get us thinking about how we talk with our kids about faith. Now, every time we look at a research shift, we're also going to look at some sticky faith ideas, things that you and I can do, things we've learned from other families, ways that we can put this into practice so that you leave here with some really tangible next steps. And, and I'm going to share some stories, share some ideas. You can come up with better ones. You can take the ideas that I'm going to share and use them as a springboard to really come up with something that works for your family. So one of the things out of our research uh, where it's not just in, a good question, good discussions, isn't just me as a parent interviewing my kids, it's me actually sharing. We in our family, we created something called Powell Time. That's my last name, Powell. My husband's my last name, Powell Time. And so at least once a month, once a month or, or sometimes twice a month, sometimes depending on our kids' age, every week, we went out with our kids and uh, we, we brought journals. Our kids picked out the journal that they wanted and we would, we have three kids and two of us. So one of us would take one and one of us would take two kids and we would do something fun and usually like cheap or free. So we would make brownies together. We would go on a hike. We would grab a smoothie, something like that. We did something fun. We'd play tennis, whatever it might be, something fun. And then we had a conversation and that's where the journals came into play. And, and I would ask our kids questions and then I would let them, and Dave did the same thing, let them ask us questions. So I'm a long-term Charger fan. I'm used to disappointment. So, no, I, yeah, because I grew up in San Diego and now here in LA, you know, it just continues to work for me. Tough loss on Thursday to the Chiefs, though, I got to say. So um, nobody cheered for the Chargers when I said Chargers. Okay, thank you, thank you. So I, maybe I'll get more applause here. So I always say I, my two favorite teams in the NFL are the Chargers. Thank you. Um, and whoever's playing the Raiders. Okay, so those are my two favorite teams. And yeah, I like the Rams too, but they're kind of a newer addition for me. So, so again, we're used to the Chargers losing. And so, uh, you know, I would, I would take my son out. I've tried to get my daughters to like football. They just haven't converted yet. But I would take my son out and in Powell time, you know, Nathan, what would you say to Philip Rivers when he threw yet again another interception in the fourth quarter? What would you say to him in the locker room? What would you say to the whole team? I'd love asking any of our kids, what do you think your friends would say they like about you? And then again, they asked me questions. And what was so fascinating is our kids got older. You know, they went from mom, what's your favorite color to what's hard at work these days? What is stressing you out, mom? So I'll tell you, if, if there was a fire in our house, I would grab my laptop, I know Fuller says it's backed up, but still, I would grab my laptop and those conversation journals. So what kind of rituals can you put into place where you're actually sharing who you are? One of the fascinating things in our research when it comes to talking is how parents who build sticky faith modeled saying, I'm sorry, were quick to apologize. When we were interviewing amazing parents, I remember calling a dad of, of three women who were in, young women who were in high school and college, 
And when it was the appointed time, I called him and said, hey, you know, we're supposed to do our hour-long interview. Is this a good time? And he says, I really don't feel like you should be talking to me. I've had to apologize to all three of my girls in the last 48 hours. And by then, we had seen this theme in research, and I said, well, that's exactly why we want to talk to you. Out of our research, I've become so much quicker to apologize to our kids, to the point that when our kids were in elementary and middle school, actually, one of the questions that we would ask often around dinner was, what mistake did you make today? What mistake did you make today? And it was an opportunity, often I would have to apologize to my kids for my tone of voice. That's usually my issue. If you were to read a transcript of what I said, the words are okay. It's the tone of voice the anger, the frustration, especially eighth and ninth grade with our middle daughter. Toughest parenting season by a zillion yards for me. So I'd have to apologize for my tone of voice. And I'll tell you, with what mistake did you make today? Like, our kids came to enjoy keeping track of my mistakes and pointing them out to me. But again, we want our family, you want your family to be a place where we can talk about mistakes, we can talk about God's grace. In fact, just last week, Jessica, our, our youngest, I can't even remember what mistake she made, but she came in, and I think she didn't do as well as a test as she was hoping to. Uh, she's in 11th grade now. And I just said, hey, Jessica, you know what? Jesus is bigger than any mistake. That's one of the mantras in our family. Jesus is bigger than any mistake. And I want to model that I'm saying I'm sorry so that our family's permeated with that sense of forgiveness and grace. I want to get back for a sec to talk about the doubt research. Ken mentioned he loves middle schoolers, as do I. There was a middle schooler at a, a church not unlike this who was a very curious, inquisitive middle schooler. Loved asking questions. And so he came to his senior pastor at the end of a sermon and said, Pastor, does God know what, that I'm going to raise my pinky finger before I even raise it? And the senior pastor said, yes, Steve, God knows which finger you're going to raise before you even raise it. And Steve was really bothered by all the pain, all the suffering in the world, especially starving children around the world. So he pulled out a copy of a, a Time magazine that had starving children in Africa and said, Pastor, does God know what's happening with these starving children in Africa? And the very well-intentioned senior pastor said, yes, Steve, God knows what's happening with those starving children in Africa, and we can trust God. Steve was so disillusioned that the pastor wasn't willing to go a little bit deeper in this really tough question about suffering that he walked out of the church that day and never again went back to a Christian church for worship. Left at middle school. Now, I've mentioned Steve. This is a Steve that all of us know. This is in the Steve Jobs biography written by Walter Isaacson, which I read when I converted from PC to Mac. Mac is better, <laughs> I'm just saying. But isn't that fascinating? That middle school Steve had a tough question. And the well-intentioned senior pastor, yes, we can trust God, and Steve just kind of, you need to do that. Steve hit the ball over the net, and there was nobody on the other side of the net to hit the ball back to him. And so out of our research and out of a lot of time with amazing parents like you, we recommend this four key word phrase, I don't know but. That's what I wish the senior pastor had said to Steve. Steve, that's such a great question. I don't know. But how about if you, me, and your dad, let's meet for coffee this week and talk about it. Or Steve, I don't know, but here's how God has been real to me in the midst of my tough questions and struggles. I don't know, but. So yesterday, our 19-year-old called. Uh, she's a sophomore at Pepperdine studying in London. And her, her freshman year, was an incredibly difficult year. She was plagued with all sorts of physical challenges. I won't get into all of them, she's fine. But thing after thing, a week at the hospital for pneumonia, I could go on and on, just thing after thing. So that she had a really, really tough freshman year. 
to the point that in May, we weren't sure if she was going to be ready to go to London now in September. But the summer was a summer of recovery for her, mental health, physically, spiritually. And so we all felt real peace about her going to London. And what's interesting is this, fresh, this, this sophomore year in London is kind of like a freshman year 2.0 for her. She's having like a more regular freshman experience these first 10 days in London than she had all last year as a freshman in Malibu. And so we were talking yesterday and she was saying how much she enjoyed it and how different it was from last year. And I said to her, Krista, I have asked God 50 times why last year was so tough for you. And she said, yeah. I said, I know you grew in Jesus. I know you grew in Jesus. And that's the most important thing. She said, you know, I think a year from now I'll have a clearer sense of why God allowed me to go through so much struggle last year, which I thought was an interesting perspective. And I told her, Krista, there are things I still can't answer about God. I didn't tell her this, but I mean, folks, I have a PhD in practical theology. I've gone to 26 grades of school, and middle schoolers can stump me with their questions about God, which I actually take comfort in, because if we could explain everything about God, then God wouldn't really be God. God would just be kind of a cool guy. So the fact that there are elements of God that we can't explain actually helps me appreciate his otherness, his holiness, which is where I don't know but is such a helpful answer. And so I told Krista, Krista, there are things I still can't answer about God. And I named a couple in our family and in our friends that I don't understand this suffering. There's so much we can point to about, uh, about God. And so part of what we've said to our kids over the years with suffering, I don't know, but Romans 5, 3, and 4, suffering leads to perseverance, perseverance to character, and character hope. I don't know why God would allow that, but here's how God has been real to me. I don't know, but I, I encourage you to just kind of put that phrase in your back pocket. For when, note I didn't say if, for when a young person asks you a tough question, you don't freak out, you don't panic, you don't shut down the conversation like Steve Jobs felt happened to him, but you hit the ball back over the net. And there's an on-ramp to go deeper because what we've seen is that builds sticky faith. When it comes to honest conversations with our kids, especially as they get older, I, I actually kind of stumbled on this in my personal experience, so this is not grounded in research per se, um, but it's grounded in my own conversations with my kids is sometimes if I have to, you know, kind of encourage my kids to do something, I have found that they respond much better if I first say, so what do you disagree with and what I've just said? And I let them critique me. And I, I try my best not to defend, I just absorb, oh yeah, you're right, good point, good point, I didn't think of that. But then when I say, what do you agree with? It's fascinating how they're quicker to say, but you know, Mom, you are probably right about this. So when it comes to having the kind of family intimacy we want to have that builds long-term faith, I offer that. Here's what's fascinating about warmth. Warmth between parent and child across the board in study after study, it really makes a difference. But here's the research twist. It's not how close you feel to your child. Instead, it's how close your child feels to you. So it's about the warmth that they perceive, not about the warmth that we perceive. So one of the principles that we've heard others say that out of our research we really encourage is when it comes, when it comes to disciplining our kids, which sometimes we have to do, first connect and then correct. First understand what is going on, what is this child after, and I'm going to give you a specific tool in about 10 or 15 minutes to do that, to really try to peel back the layers. What is going on? What are they hungry for? And then, then 
we have the opportunity to correct. So, sticky faith ideas, as long as you have relationship, you have influence. This was said to us by one of the parents that we interviewed, and it was so profound. As long as we have relationships, we have influence. Now, why is there that picture of popcorn? To remind me to tell you the story of, of what this family did as an example of continuing to maintain relationship. Their child had come home, middle schooler had come home, really grumpy, bad mood, went to their room. Parent tried to interact with them. The kid wasn't having anything to do with it. It was not about what the parent had done. It was just the kid had had a tough day at school. And so, you know, sometimes, I'll be honest, when my kids are grumpy with me, I can take it personally. It can hurt my feelings. But what this wise family did is they reached out to their middle schooler. And they left him alone for a while, but then the mom made some popcorn and went up and took it to his room and sat on the edge of his bed and slowly was able to unpack what had happened in the school day that put him in such a bad mood. It's so tempting when our kids push away from us to push away from them. It's so tempting when our kids are angry, frustrated, disappointed, stressed, anxious. I, I grew up swimming, and so I think about a swimming pool. And, you know, our kid is on the edge of the swimming pool, and they kind of kick away from us in ways that are developmentally appropriate. But at least I can take it personally. And when they kick away from us, we can feel dented, cracked, bruised. And in some of my worst moments, I've thought, okay, well then I'll show them that them being like a 12-year-old, okay? But in my own lack of maturity, in my own lack of sanctification, in my own sin, in my own anger, in my own insecurity, I withdraw. And what Lisa DeMore says, this wonderful psychologist who's focused on adolescent girls, but what she says relates to both, is she urges adults, mentors and parents, to be a wall. To be a wall. That when your kid kicks away from you, you don't move. When your kid hurts your feelings, you do not react. You absorb it. Eventually, you share your feelings. But the reason she says to be a wall is, again, think about a swimming pool. That kid kicks away. They're, they're treading water in the deep end. Eventually, eventually, they'll come back to the wall. And if we can be that wall that's stable and steady, it's so much easier for them to come back to us. Because as long as we have relationship, we have influence. So warmth. Is something we can build it every day. Other creative ideas we got from families, and again, I'm just gonna share kind of a couple popcorn ideas. You can come up with better ones. Um, I love what one family did, where they wanted to make sure they had one-on-one -on -one time with each of their kids, you know, the equivalent of pal time. And so they did birthday dates. So like, our youngest was born on May 6th. And so the sixth of every month, one of the parents got one-on-one -on -one time with that kid. So whatever day of the month your kid was born in, you just flag that in your calendar. And whether it's grabbing a donut on the way to school or whether it's going on a hike or grabbing a Jamba Juice afterwards, whatever it might be, great way to just in the midst of the busyness of family life, slow down and get some time one-on-one -on -one with our kids. A lot of parents were really good at using bedtime and building warmth and intimacy here. Uh, this is not me. Okay, I am like a morning person. I woke up at 5.30 today, no problem. I, 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 I'm, my husband says I'm permanently on East Coast time. And so like nights, I am not good at nights. I am not a good tucker inner with our kids. We still tuck in our kids even though they stay up later than we do, but we still have kind of some rituals. But I mean, I, I'm embarrassed to say this, like there have been evenings when like as my kids are brushing their teeth, I'll be like, okay, let's go ahead and pray while you're brushing your teeth. Like because um, I'm exhausted, I want to get to bed, etc. You know, Dave, when our kids were younger especially, he would tuck in our kids and take like a half an hour and let's just say I've that would not be my norm. Um, but, you know, it, 
a lot of families really love bedtime and have different rituals. We do have a prayer that we pray every night with our kids. Now we're at the point where if like we miss a word, then they, they add it for us, which is kind of fun. So they know what we're praying for for them and have been since they were before, before they were even born. For a lot of families, bedtime is a really rich time. It is for my husband, it's not for me. And again, part of what we wanna to do today, and I know Ken's heart, is to offer a lot of ideas and you figure out what fits you as a parent and your family better. Let's also talk and get really practical about time. About time. So we've looked at conversations, we've looked at warmth, now we're looking at time. There's kind of a long-term debate when it comes to parenting. Is it about the quantity of time or the quality of time? I love what my friends Reggie Joyner and Carrie Newhoff say, it's the quantity of quality time. So it's really, it's really both. It's the quantity of quality time. Um, for a lot of families, family dinner is rich. And I'll say one of my favorite things about the pandemic, in fact, maybe mm, one of my favorite things about the pandemic was all of a sudden, you know, we had, we had three teenage kids and we weren't doing 12 minute dinners before one of them ran to volleyball and one of them ran to church worship practice and somebody had to go do homework or a study session. Like we would have relaxed 45 minute dinners where we would just talk and unpack. Not, not every night, but a lot of nights we would have that. But I think most of the time our dinners are, are often rushed, not nearly as deep as we would want. We might have expectations for a kind of conversation that's gonna happen and the reality falls short of that. I'm gonna play you about a four minute clip from the middle, which is a TV show that's not even on anymore, um, where the mom's trying to have a meaningful family dinner and it unfolds in ways that maybe you can relate to. So let's watch this three or four minute clip. What are you doing? We having company or something? No, I don't know. I just thought we'd eat in here. Did the kids break the big TV? Hey, kids, get in here. No, no, nobody broke the TV. No, I just thought, you know, we don't have to eat with the TV every night. We could just sit and talk to each other. Whoa, why are there plates on the table? Because that's where we're eating dinner. What? I don't want to watch the little TV. <gasps> Did someone break the big TV? The TVs are fine. We're just not watching them until after supper. Tonight, we're having a family dinner in here for a change. Dad? You heard your mother? Everybody, sit down. What is the big deal? We've eaten at the table before. I don't have a chair. Huh. I guess we hadn't really eaten at the table since we had brick. Not a problem. We have more chairs outside. Dad, why are we doing this? Uh, maybe your mom and I need to uh, talk to you. I don't know. Are you getting a divorce? Let's see how this goes. This will be fun. You know, this is actually how a lot of people eat dinner every night. They sit and they face each other and they ask each other questions about how their day went. Let's do that. So what was your high and what was your low of the day? My low is right now. Fine, I'll do it. My high is having dinner here with my family. My low is the comment that Axel just made. Sue. My high was that the guy who sits next to me in science saw me in the hallway today and seemed to sort of recognize me. Hmm. My low was that I was wrong. He didn't. The loser! What did I say about sneezing words at your sister? My low is realizing that my family never bought a chair for me. My high is I can eat food right off the table. Oh, uh, wait, I want to change my low. Okay, all right, all right. Let's well, just forget highs and lows. Do something different. Mm. Everybody, look at the person on your left and say something nice. You mean well. <laughs> Thank you. Axel, you do soon? Oh. Your head is basically the right size for your body. Uh, uh, really? You're not just saying that. No, it's everything like below the head that's got the problem. Shut up. You know what shuts people up? TV. Listen, you kids are not even trying. 
your brother and sister, and this is the only relationship that is going to last your whole life. You know, someday your dad and I are not going to be around anymore, and you're only going to have each other. Are you dying? That's why we're eating at the table. She's dying. No, I'm not dying. Oh, my God. Dad's dying. Nobody is dying. Why can't we all just die now and get it over with? Mike. Uh, Axel, what just about dying. What about dying? What about dying? What about just made by everybody. All right, that's it. That's it. You three are going to start loving each other right now because that's what your mother wants. <laughs> right? Is that what you want? <laughs> So again, maybe family dinners are nothing like that for you, but for the rest of us who conversations don't quite unfold and we try to do times of affirmation, just take courage that sometimes family dinners work and sometimes they don't work so well. I'll tell you, family game nights in terms of time, a lot. How many of you play games with your kids? Yeah, okay, so family game nights, um, having portable games, games in the car, games if you go out to a restaurant, games, games, games. A lot, was, actually I was surprised by how many families, especially families of young adults said, we still pl play games. Family game nights, really key. Um, using car time, using car time. Um, I'll, I'll just say that some of my best conversations with our kids, hands down, have been in the car. Um, which then creates a challenge when your kid gets their driver's license, right? All of a sudden, you don't have as much time in the car with them. So uh, we learned this great idea from one of the moms that we interviewed that, that Dave and I have put into practice with each of our kids. When each of our kids has gotten their driver's license, we have said to them, you know, we're thrilled that you have your license. Um, and, and yet at the same time, the car is some of the best conversations that we have. And our relationship with you is more important than the convenience of you being able to drive yourself. So we want to keep having good conversations with you. So either we need to have good conversations other times and places, or we'll keep driving you around. Guess who gets pretty chatty in the kitchen and in the family room and yeah, over meals. But we've said that to each of our kids, and I really think it's made a difference. And a few times we've had to nudge, like, okay, we're missing conversation with you. Maybe we should start driving you around. And that calibrates things for them. So, um, so using car time, and then when you lose that, figuring out how you're going to compensate for that. What if my child doesn't want to spend time with me? What if my child just doesn't seem to be interested in spending time with me? Best thing I can share was something that I learned from a mom uh, in the Bay Area who I met, and, and single mom with a high school boy, and this high school boy doesn't want to do much with her. And in fact, um, she's tried. You want to go get some dinner? No, nah, it's okay. You want to go shopping? No way, mom. She's tried thing after thing to try to connect with her boy. And then she realized that her son is into movies loves movies and film. And so this mom has become a student of movies and film. She's understanding actors and actresses and directors and genres and the Oscars and all this so that she can talk with her son about movies. The only time the son says yes to spending time with her is when she says, hey, do you want to go see such and such movie? And she thinks ahead about the conversations they might be able to have on the way there, on the way back, because she's researched it. This wise mom, she often chooses movie theaters that are geographically further than needed, so she gets that extra time with her boy. This mom doesn't even particularly like film or movies, but she loves her son. And so she's willing to become an avid student of film and movies and dive into that. Because this is an interesting switch, that the older our kids get, the more we have to lean into their worlds instead of expecting them to lean into ours. So we've looked at how we talk about faith and just kind of family intimacy and conversation. We've looked at warmth. We've looked at time. Now we're going to look at questions. Questions. And this is actually the newest research that we've done 
um, that I was thinking about who you are and my own experience as parents, as a parent, um, I, I definitely wanted to bring you up to speed on some of the very new research we've done related to sticky faith questions. Um, we've spent time with uh, dozens of students doing deep dive interviews, and then we paired that with about 2,000 focus groups and surveys of students nationwide. And, and also, we learned quite a bit from the theological and psychological faculty at Fuller Seminary. And so our conclusion as the Fuller Youth Institute is that young people are driven by three questions. Identity, who am I? Belonging, where do I fit? And purpose, what difference can I make? Identity, belonging, and purpose. And so earlier I was saying, like, how do we empathize with our kids? How do we understand what they're doing? This has become my favorite tool to understand my own kids, actually any young person, and actually myself. I'll start with myself. If I'm feeling heat about something, if, I'm, if something's kind of triggering me emotionally, I ask myself, so what is going on here? Is this shaking my sense of identity, my sense of belonging, my sense of purpose? Almost always for me, it's identity. That I struggle with feeling not enough. Not so much at work or at Fuller. I don't struggle with it there, but I struggle with it as a mom. I compare myself to you all and all these amazing parents and the amazing parents that we research. And so how my kids respond to me can spark things in me. As they've gotten older, I can now talk with them about that and let them know some, you know some of the unhealthy things that I know I do that I'm working on. But when I, when I feel heat about an issue and something's just kind of bubbling inside of me and I ask, okay, is this about my identity? Is this about my belonging? Is this about my purpose? Similarly with our kids. Are they looking for identity? Are they looking for belonging? Are they looking for purpose? Our, our, our youngest uh, is, a, is a volleyball player and she's a junior, and she really wanted to be captain of her school volleyball team this fall, a month ago, when they made the decisions for captain. Like, to the point that she talked about it every day when she came home from practice. Was she gonna be named captain? Was she not gonna be named captain? There was one senior that everybody knew was gonna be captain, but they usually have two captains, so would it be a junior, which is what Jessica is, and so on and so forth. And, and like, I, she was ruminating on this so much. It was puzzling me until I stopped and went, wait a second. Is Jessica looking for identity? Is she looking for belonging? Is she looking for purpose? What was interesting is this was actually two of them. She wanted, she wanted to see herself as a leader, and then she wanted to be that leader. So it was both identity and purpose. Well, turns out the coaches went with just one captain, that one senior, and so Jessica wasn't captain. And on the one hand, that meant that there wasn't somebody else who was the second captain, but on the other hand, she still wasn't captain. And so because, because I had this lens of identity, belonging, purpose, our conversation with Jessica then became, okay, so you're not captain, how do you still lead on the court? How do you lead when you rotate off and you're on the bench? Whenever one of my kids is doing something that doesn't make sense to me, if I stop and ask, are they hungry for identity, are they hungry for belonging, or are they hungry for purpose, it's like the penny drops, and it all makes sense. So I invite you to think about your own kids, things they're doing that just seem a little askew, a little surprising, and ask, which of these questions are they hungry for? As, I somewhat, as I somewhat implied by what I said, all of us, I think these are human questions, not just young people questions. But for those of us over 30, these questions are generally at a low simmer. For teenagers and young adults and sometimes children, these questions are at a rolling boil. And so let's think about how to build sticky faith with these questions. When it comes to identity, how do we lean into our kids' sparks? our kids' passions, our kids' interests, our kids' hobbies. Just like that mom, that single mom who spent time with her boy who loved movies. What is it that your kid loves and how do you lean into that? And how do you do that in such a way that you don't show favoritism? There's some fascinating research out of USC, a longitudinal study of families that indicates that when 
Kids perceive favoritism in the family, and that's kids' perception, not our perception. When kids perceive favoritism in the family, they tend to distance themselves from that parent or parents and anything that's important to those parents. So think about faith. If our kids are perceiving favoritism, then they might distance themselves from us and our faith. There's a paragraph in one of our books that's gotten more interest from dads and stepdads than any other, and it's about favoritism and sports. Because it's a lot easier for many parents and many dads and stepdads to connect with that kid who's into sports. But it's harder to connect with that kid who's into drama or into Girl Scouts or into something that you don't have in your background. And this is an issue for me. I've I've already said I love watching football. A good Sunday afternoon after church for me is a game or two and a nap. Like, that's heaven. And growing up, Nathan and I, we would watch games most Sunday afternoons together. The girls, no interest in football. Our youngest, especially when she was younger, she loves art. She loves arts and crafts. Nobody in their whole life has called me an arts and crafts person. (laughs) Like when Dave and I got married, he came into our marriage with two glue guns. I came into our marriage with zero glue guns. My least favorite store on the planet is Michael's. (laughs) Poorly organized, long lines, chaotic, with not much there that I really want to buy. But Jessica's into art. Jessica likes crafts. And so I would say to her, especially in middle school, elementary school, hey, Jay, you know, you want to you wanna watch football with me? No, Mom. Jay, you want to ride scooters in the neighborhood? No, Mom. Jay, you want to, you, you know, you want to take a walk? No, Mom. Jessica, do you want to go to Michael's and get some art supplies? Yeah, that would be great. <laughs> and I would just have to suck it up and do it because of this research. So think about your kids and what they're into. And is it easier for you to support some and not others? And what message is that sending? And hey, maybe I'll see you at Michael's sometime. (laughs) Belonging. One of the interesting facets of our belonging research is how important stories are. How groundbreaking stories are. And one of the fascinating things is I've spent time with parents is how few of us are sharing our spiritual journey with our kids. Remember, I'm not even saying you have to be more spiritual. I'm saying share with your kids the spirituality you have. So one youth pastor was intrigued by some of our research on sticky faith and on a short-term missions trip, so fairly engaged kids, he asked 20 kids, do you know how your parents became Christians? Would you like to guess how many of those 20 knew how their parents became Christians? I'll give you a hint, it starts with a Z. Zero, zero. And I share, this, I share this story with rooms of pastors, and pastors come up with me afterwards and say, you know what, my kids actually don't know how I decided to follow Jesus. I like to pray in the mornings. And before our research, as my kids would see me pray, I would think, isn't it great that they're seeing me pray? And that's true. But out of our research, I'm verbalizing more with my kids. See, I pray for my kids and for Dave holistically, Most mornings, I pray for them physically, emotionally, spiritually, mentally, and relationally. And so, out of our research, if one of our kids comes and says, hey, mom, where are my shoes as I'm praying? I'll first say, hey, can I show you the page of my prayer journal where I'm praying for you? What do you want me to be praying for you in addition to this? And by the way, I think your shoes are down the hall in the laundry room. I love that my kids have seen that model, but out of our research, I'm also sharing more about my spiritual journey with my kids. And then purpose. We want to lean into the question of our kids' purpose. Diana Garland um, out of Baylor did some wonderful research that serving together as families is especially generative. Not only do we have an amazing experience, but we get to be part of seeing God's kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. We can debrief it, we can discuss it afterwards. 
And I think what's a shame in a lot of families and a lot of churches is it's we, or we're serving, but we're serving separately. So the kids are serving in youth ministry or Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts. You know, moms are serving through women's ministry, dads and their dad, you know, through men's ministry, all these different things, but we're not serving together. So out of our research, uh, I set a goal that our family would serve together once a month. The first year, we served together twice in the entire year. I share that just to say that you're going to set goals and you're going to struggle. But what was fascinating is during the pandemic, again, all three teenagers home, during, doing school on home, at home, and our, husband, our, our son doing college online, we ended up serving together every Thursday at STARS, a ministry that was doing mentoring and then during the pandemic became food distribution. And we would show up Thursday afternoons at 3.30 or 4 after it was closed, masks, gloves, and we would clean. We cleaned STARS for about an hour every Thursday during the pandemic. We swept, we mopped. I'll tell you, I swept and mopped more at STARS than I ever have like in my own home, like exponentially more. And I think our kids would say that some of their best family pandemic memories were those times when we served together in STARS. And maybe your service together could be virtually. You sponsor a kid through compassion and, and you're together writing letters or you know, how, whatever it might look like. But I just invite you to think about how in the spirit of purpose, how can you serve together? I can't not talk with you about mental health. If this talk was three years ago, I would not be talking to you about mental health. But when it comes to questions about faith and questions we get asked, this is now the number one question we at the Full Youth Institute get asked by parents and by leaders. I don't know a family with teenage girls that's not dealing with anxiety and stress. The research tells me they exist but I don't know. Boys' rates, at least in some, some studies, are about half the rates of girls when it comes to anxiety and stress. But in the midst of the pandemic, across all generations, anxiety has tripled, depression has quadrupled, according to the CDC. And our young people are bearing the brunt of that. And so again, three years ago on a stick, talk on Sticky Faith, I wouldn't be talking about this, but now, we need to talk about it. We have resources. We have a parrot podcast that I, just on mental health that I encourage you to listen to. I can get Ken the link and he can send it out. Um, but, but I want to give you some really practical, like here's how you respond to your kids based on our research, based on uh, things we've found work really well with kids. And when it comes to responding to kids who are struggling with anxiety, What's fascinating is as we did all this research and we talked to Fuller alum who are therapists and we read, you know, we did an extensive lit review on mental health. And when we thought about what do we most want parents and leaders to know, it actually spells out A, B, C, D, E. Okay. So A, B, C, D, E. That's what we're going to look at when it comes to mental health. Hopefully memorable. Um, my, my top recommendation for a therapist in the Pasadena area who deals with mental health, when we interviewed him, one of the best ideas he gave us is this question. If a young person is, you think is struggling with mental health, ask them on a scale of one to 10, can you rate your anxiety with 10 being the worst? If there are one to three, it's no big deal. Four or five is probably handleable. Six or above is when you want to think about getting some kind of intervention or help. So, by the way, scale of one to 10 questions are just great in general with young people. It helps them make it more tangible. But I love this question specifically when it comes to mental health. So that's the A, ask. The B is breathe. The B is breathe. What's fascinating is God has given us an alarm system when it comes to anxiety and stress, which is, you know, a, a, a adrenaline starts pumping, et cetera. And what's fascinating is God has given us a brake system too to take d deep breaths that literally tells our lungs and our heart to slow down. If you've been around somebody who's having a panic attack, they often have a hard time breathing. And so if you're with a young person who struggles with anxiety or stress, work ahead of time on some breathing exercises. And if you just Google them, you can get two or three, that'll, that'll be really helpful. Again, ahead of time. The C, the C 
is how can we help our young people center on a helpful truth or phrase, a biblical truth or phrase, something that becomes the rock that they stand upon. So in our family, Emmanuel has become a meaningful phrase for us. Jesus is with us. Emmanuel. And so if our kids are going through something tough, it would be really typical for me or Dave to text them and just say, Emmanuel, praying for you. One of our daughters was struggling with anxiety and, and for a while, and, and what the helpful truth is or phrases for her were worship songs. So ahead of something that she knew was going to be tough, we would talk about, okay, what worship song can you remind yourself of? What lyric can you cling to? It could be a scripture verse, but again, ahead of time, how do we help our kids have um, a helpful truth or phrase? The D is develop a team. Parenting is not a solo sport. That's why Ken and his team wanted us all to come together. I love that at lunch there'll be time to get to know other parents. Develop a team. And if, when, if your young person is struggling with mental health, who's the team that can support them? Is there a teacher that they can talk to so that they know, that teacher knows that if your kid's having a hard time in math class, the teacher's already aware. Is there a friend? Is there a therapist? Many of our kids are struggling in such a way that mental health professionals would be so helpful. And some of them, even there might need to be some psychiatric medication and prescriptions that are given. We at Fuller, we have a school of psychology that integrates faith with those kinds of questions. And so develop your team. And then the E is how do we empower through empathy? Empower through empathy. I'm going to give you another phrase. I mentioned Lisa Demore, the psychologist earlier. She has this great phrase that she encourages for mental health. That stinks, and I think you can handle it. Two-part phrase. One is empathy, and one is empowering. Oh, that sounds really tough. Boy, if I had your class schedule, I would be stressed too. Boy, that, that does seem really tough. How do you think you can handle it? I think you can handle it. What can I do to help you handle it? There's all sorts of variations that we can offer, but how do we empathize and how do we empower? So again, these are the biggest questions. Mental health is the biggest question we get asked, and so I just, I can't not give you the ABCDEs. And in our last 10 minutes before we go to Q&A, we're gonna talk about uh, Sticky Faith Team. The team... The team, again, parenting is not a solo sport. The team that can help us build sticky faith. Again, a research twist. We looked at 13 different youth group participation variables, 13 things that kids tend to do in the context of youth group. And you'll be glad to know that studying scripture was correlated with mature faith in high school. Being involved in student leadership was correlated with mature faith in high school and college. I could go on and on. But of the 13 things we studied... The one that was most correlated with mature faith in high school and college was intergenerational relationships and worship. When I say that to a group of youth leaders, usually they say, wow. Because as youth ministry has gotten, children's ministry has gotten more and more professionalized and there's amazing facilities like this and amazing leaders like Ken, it's easy to siloize young people from the rest of the church. And what we see in our research is that hurts young people And that hurts the church, too. So from a very deep place based on faith and research, I want your kids to have a handful of meaningful intergenerational relationships, what we at Fuller call, thanks to Chap Clark, the five-to-one ratio. The five-to-one ratio. See, historically in children's and youth ministry, we might say, Oh, for Sunday mornings or upcoming retreat, we want one adult for every five kids. What we're saying out of our research is what if we change that and it's not one adult for every five kids, but it's five adults for each kid. Five adults who, as we say in our family, are on your team. Five adults who are that safe place for you to go to when you just can't go to mom or dad about something. Five adults who are that safety net for you. Not if you struggle, but when you struggle in faith and life. I love the show Parenthood. 
the old show Parenthood, and they capture so well what it looks like to have adults investing in kids in this four minute clip we're gonna watch together. I want that kind of family for my three kids. I want that for every kid at our church. I want that for every kid represented by adults here. I want that for every kid in our country and I want that for every kid on the planet that there would be adults who are on their team, who are part of their family. And here's the awesome God-sized news, is the church already gives us such an amazing opportunity to develop those relationships. Odds are good that there are people in this room or people you know from your church who could be that somewhat aunt, who could be that mentor, who could talk to your kid about dating or career or whatever it might be. In fact, that was a game we used to like to play with our kids. Who would you talk to about? Just to get them thinking about what adults can they talk to about all sorts of things. So whether it's something structured or whether it's more organic and casual that you as a parent or step-parent create, how do we create more intergenerational mentoring? How do we create intergenerational groups? For a while, our family was an, intergeneration, was an intergenerational group with a family in our life stage, family still having babies, and then two 70-plus year olds. We let the kids come up with the name of the group. They called it Viper. So that was the name of our group. We met every th- two to three weeks or so for Viper, with the kids being together for sometimes a whole meeting, sometimes just a large chunk of it. But it was our intergenerational mentoring Senior adults, if you're familiar from the, with that scene from Up, senior adults, you have a special place when it comes to intergenerational mentoring. I love how many grandparents are here. And there's so many exciting ways that, that grandparents are investing in their own grandkids. But here's, and here's what I want you to think about. As one grandparent came up to me and said, you know, My grandkids live across the country and I've been praying for God to bring mentors into their lives. He said, I'm just realizing I can be the answer to prayer of another grandparent praying the same for the kids in our church. So grandparents, you have a special, special role or senior adults in general. Uh, I want to close by sharing how we've tried to embody this in our, in our family, and then we'll go to Q&A for a bit. Um, I'll, I'll back up. So uh, when each of our kids has turned 13, we've wanted to cement for them that there's this team of adults who are, who are with them. And so I'll, I'll tell you what we did with Nathan, but we did the same thing with our girls. It's just easier to talk about one kid at a time. Plus, I like him better. No, I'm kidding. Um, so We went to Nathan, our oldest, and we said, you know, bud, you've heard us talk about Sticky Faith. You've heard us talk about this team. You've heard us talk about five adults. Over the course of the summer, before you turn 13, we want you to spend a little bit of time with five different men. Five different men who you look up to, who you'd like to get to know. And he rattled off the names of five men that was who Dave and I were expecting. And so we went to each of these five men and said, will you spend some time with Nathan sometime this summer before he turns 13? We don't care if you, you know, take him to Costco or take him on a hike, whatever it is, spend some time with him. Can you share some life advice and some spiritual advice? Every one of the five men said yes. And, you know, they did creative things with Nathan. We are not a golfing family. And so one of them took Nathan golfing. This is at the Rose Bowl. Um, I love this picture because in the upper left corner, you can see a thumb. Well, that's Roger's thumb. And Rogers was one of the 70 plus people in our Viper small group who Nathan wanted to spend time with. And Roger took Nathan golfing. In the midst of Nathan getting time with these five men, Dave, remember, he's the crafty one in our family. I kept all this organized, but Dave, he's the crafty one. And so with each of our kids, he made a box that we call their team box. And so uh, we, the, the five men wrote down their life and spiritual advice. We got a picture with Nathan, with each of the five men. All of that went into the box. Uh, Nathan and Dave, and then later Chris and Jessica, built these boxes together. Part of why we made it a box is so that we could add more people as God brought more team members. And so this is Perry, 
who uh, was Nathan's high school pastor. We invited Perry a little bit later on to be part of Nathan's team and in the team box took a picture and Nathan took Perry for, uh, frisbee golfing. Um, and, and so, you know, Nathan and our girls have had this sense that here's this team of adults. Well, fast forward and Nathan wanted to get baptized. Uh, and in our tradition, it, it's a, a later baptism, not an infant baptism. And so when it was, he said he wanted to get baptized. So when it was time for him to get baptized, out of our research, Dave and I said, well, you know, we, we would love to be um, in the pool with you. Uh, and what if you picked a mentor? What if you picked somebody else to be in the pool with you also? And so this is Nathan's baptism in our backyard. You can see my husband and I are on the sides, each of which are, we're near one of our girls. That's Jeff on the left, who was the pastor, and that's Roger uh, on the right. Roger, the 70 plus thumb in the picture adult. That's who Nathan wanted to be in the pool with him. And you know, when we said, Nathan, why don't you choose one of the five to be in the pool? He looked over to the side and he said, hmm, I just don't know which one to choose. Can I tell you what that meant to me and Dave, that our son's tension was which one of these amazing men should he choose? And so this was when Nathan was about 14 uh, we continue to try to reinforce this idea of a five-person team and just all these adults. Um, when uh, Nathan, oh, you know what, I'm sorry, there, I thought there were some more pictures, but I'll just keep talking. Um, when, when Nathan uh, graduated and when he turned 18, all of our kids play volleyball. Uh, they're tall, I'm six feet tall. Our kids are all tall and athletic and not aggressive. So volleyball is a perfect sport because you get into trouble when you touch the other team. And so volleyball has been a great sport for all three pal kids. Um, and so we got a volleyball and we did the same for Krista and we'll do the same with Jessica when she turns 18. We got a volleyball and like I and Dave, we drove it around Southern California getting the adults who are meaningful in Nathan's life to sign that volleyball. And we presented it to him on his 18th birthday. You can do a t-shirt, you could do a piece of sheet music, whatever it might be, but for us it was a volleyball. Nathan took that volleyball to college and yeah, I bought a $6 stand on Amazon that the volleyball went on and Nathan's freshman year was 2019 to 2020 when the pandemic kicked off in, in, over his spring break, in fact. In fact, he was home in March for spring break when his school in Texas said, students don't bother coming back. We're gonna pack up all your stuff Stay, you know, stay where you are, stay home. We're going to do online school from spring break through the rest of the year. And so Nathan wasn't going to go back and pack up his stuff. And so we were talking and, and Nathan's like, well, I don't really care about my clothes. I don't really care about my books. But he said, but I do care about that volleyball. We couldn't do anything about it. The university was packing everything up. Nathan stayed home for five months, did online college, went back to his school in Texas in August, and I called him the day that he arrived that night, and he had gotten his stuff. And one of his first few sentences to me was, Mom, the volleyball's okay. The volleyball's okay. And it's still on that $6 stand in his apartment now that he's a college senior. So I know we've covered a lot, and you're going to continue to cover a lot today. My prayer is that the Holy Spirit would show you a few ideas, a few practices, a few relationships to build that can be, be that encouragement. And in fact, um, we would love to give you a free copy of a book. I didn't, Ken, is this okay? I didn't even ask you this. But if you want to text the word FAITH to 66866, you can get a free chapter of uh, one of my favorite books for parents, our Sticky Faith uh, Family Guide, as well as free resources. Now that number 66866, that's a lot of sixes in a row. And some of you might be a little bit worried about that. Uh, but here's the good news, there's an eight right in the middle. So y'all are totally clear when it comes to, you know, end times numerology. It's all good, it's Fuller Seminary approved. Okay, 66866. So um, Ken and Amanda, I think are gonna come and field questions so we can continue to learn from each other.